First, I want to say thank you for your time and your attention this evening uh, and for joining us as I get to share my story with you. Uh, a real special thank you to Dr. Kim and all of the College of Business and particularly all of my homies here in the accounting department. I wouldn't really be here uh, without the amazing professors and this university. Um, so thank you. So I'm going to start off today by acknowledging that we are standing on special lang of the Thongban people. There are people who came before us and we are lucky to be sitting here today. Um, and I'm humbled to share my story with you. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to spend a good chunk of time talking and at the end I believe there's a question answer period where you all can ask all the interesting questions that you have and I hope I've got some answers that either answer them or inspire you. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started. And now this is where I get to handle a mic and a clicky thingy. When I came to LMU over 20 years ago, I chose to come here because of its commitment to educating the whole person. And I didn't really have an appreciation of how much that was going to prepare me for the rest of my time here on this planet. Um, Dr. Kim mentioned I am a vice president and controller at SoCal Gas. I am a mom. I am a very proud LMU lioness. But that really is just a couple of the things that I navigate on a day to day basis. I highlight that for you and I put up a little bit of a laundry list of some of the things I am depending on the day, because if you're living life correctly, it's a long list. And I think it's really important to recognize that each of us is a multidimensional individual that is put here on this planet to serve a bigger purpose. And some days that means number one priority is being mommy. And sometimes that means it's different things, but just wanted to take that time to acknowledge it. Cause as you leave here, the list continues to grow and get longer. And part of the fun and part of the struggle is just navigating and balancing those different aspects. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out is Coming to a place like LMU really helped ground me in values that came from my family and put a name to them. And it's really kept me uh, grounded throughout my journey. You'll come across obstacles and challenges. And if you just go back to your values, it'll help guide you in the decision that you should make. So um, before we get started, I want you to think about a couple of things. What are your values? Respect, introspection, curiosity, integrity, open-mindedness, how do your values align with the career that you're choosing? How are they going to align with where you're headed? The roles and titles are going to change over time, but your values will help you guide, will help guide you, especially in times of obstacles and challenges. So now that I figured out how to use the clicker, we're going to get this show on the road. Since we're standing in the College of Business and we're standing here as part of a series that was named for an eminent accounting professor, I wanted to take the time to first start off talking about what's going on in the accounting profession. And then I'll talk a little bit about my journey and then I'll highlight some takeaways of both key moments and key people that I met in my life to just share with you a little bit of what I learned. I'm really multitasking here. Pages, got clickers. Here we go. So I know what my experience is like in accounting. All of you have your current experiences as accounting and whatever your profession may be. I'm hoping there's a couple of you in here that aren't accounting professionals. Um, you'll have your own journeys. I've really found it helpful over time to take a look at what data is out there, what surveys are out there, talk to colleagues, talk to students, try to understand, talk to professors and understand like what's going on in my profession. Because you may just be one person, you may feel like one cog in the wheel, but if you know where you stand in the bigger picture, you can start to think about what you can do as an individual within that profession to open doors, open opportunities, and to continue to thrive. Um, the accounting profession is a really special one. People really rely on us for the integrity of the marketplace. You know, I don't know how many of you are, how many of you own stock or your parents own stock, right? You rely pretty heavily on the accounting profession to get you comfortable with putting money out there. So I bring that up to just say, hey, you might be sitting there being an accountant, but what's going on in the profession? So I wanted to highlight a couple of things. And before I get to that, there was a really interesting report that was recently issued on the Cal CPA website that is a result of five studies that were performed. So the first thing that this study identified is that there's a diversity gap between senior leadership of the profession and the whole of the accounting and finance workforce. So what that pretty much means is you look at who starts and you look at who's in leadership and there's a huge gap between the two of them. Accounting and finance professionals are leaving because of a lack of good DE&I and a lack of a sense of belonging. The research has resulted as a wake up call for our profession to take action. Strides have been made, but there is still a gap that has to be filled. 
The future of accounting and finance rests not only on the shoulders of current and future leaders, but also with others who have a natural role as conveners and drivers of change. And what that means is you may not be an accounting professional, but when you get out in the workforce in five or six years, you can challenge your accounting firm to ask about their stats and their demographics and how they are propelling DE&I and inclusion and belonging. This is gonna require professionals, students, academics, and professional associations. So that's each one of us that are in here. And I think the end wraps it up nicely. Representation matters, especially at the leadership level. So that's what the high level global survey results say. And now we'll tackle a little bit about the specifics in the US. So I found this one to be interesting. This is all based on 2019 information. It was just re uh, released in 2022. But for every 10 of the profession's most senior leaders, nine are white, eight are male, and a few openly identify as LGBTQIA, which is kind of shocking when you look at some of the next stats that we've got going on. So the study goes on to measure the statistics for various demographics. Table one clearly shows the gap between the US population, the accounting and auditor workforce, and senior leadership positions. I'll tell you a little bit about my journey as a Latina and Mexican American here, but if you just take a look at the Hispanic stats, it's quite shocking, really. 18.5% of the population in 2019 is Latino or Hispanic, 8.9% are represented, only 1.6 are sitting CFOs for Fortune 500 and S&P companies, and 2% in 2018 were partners in CPA firms. As you look at the other stats, it gets very interesting as well. One of the ones I find really interesting is 61.7% of the accountants and auditor workforce were female in 2019, which is actually larger than the population. But then you start to look at what happens in the stats, and it just doesn't make any sense. The second one here, the second table, talks about four factors that they asked underrepresented individuals to consider and really drive why we are not represented in senior roles. And you can see here, they ask questions around whether or not you know, people feel that, um, uh, the third one's an interesting one, right? There's greater emphasis on recruitment than retention for this group, right? Leaders demonstrate unfair prejudice. This group does not consistently receive fair treatment in the recruitment process. All things for us to think about. These other stats here, I promise it'll get a little more cheery as we go on. <laughs> Um, but table five here shows that diverse talent overwhelmingly perceives an inequitable workplace and the stats for all the demographics are terrible. You take a look at this and they ask the question, I believe this group receives equitable treatment. 16% of non-white Hispanic or Latino said no, right? Like there's a lot of work here to be done, right? Table six, table six takes it a little step further. I think my table four should say table six, so table four takes a little step further and shows that on average, 50% of lesser respondents believe the profession to be equitable or inclusive. In contrast, if you take a look at the white male non-LGBTQIA, they're not great stats, but they're over the 60s. 67% believe it's equitable and 69% believe the profession is inclusive. The reason this disparity is um, an issue is because as we just saw from the previous slide, most of leadership is white males that are non-LGBTQIA. So they perceive less of a problem with the industry from an inclusivity perspective and from an equity perspective, which means not a lot's gonna change, right? So I highlight these factors and bring you back to the point of all of this, which is in order for us to be successful, in order for this industry to continue to be successful and in order for people to thrive, you have to feel like you belong. And so what does that really mean, right? I've pulled in here the definition of belonging from the report, which is rather lengthy, but I think it kind of, once you take a look at it and distill it, you get to the point. Belonging is a feeling of security and support when there is a sense of acceptance, inclusion, and identity for a member of a certain group or place, and the basic fundamental drive to form and maintain lasting, positive, and significant relationships with others. And so I put this up there because as you go through your process, you will find yourself in positions where on day one you feel like you belong. You will find yourself in positions where it feels like that on day one, but maybe it takes a little turn through the process. And sometimes you might get there and realize like, it just doesn't feel like it's working. I just don't feel like I fit. And that's not to say that all the onus is on the company, but if that's the case, push them, 
challenge them in a thoughtful and respectable way. Meet them halfway. If you're sensing that there isn't a place of belonging, create that belonging for others, right? Just remember kind of how that feels and what it results in in stats and be the difference maker for your profession, for your career, for your company, and for yourself. So now that I set the stage a little bit on the profession and the context, I think I'll dive right into my journey. So I got a couple picks here and I'll walk through them um, and they'll have like a little bit more of an explanation, but I'll spend the next 25, 30 minutes or so talking about my journey from student, or in my case, from, you know, a first, uh, first generation Mexicana, America Chicana, however you want to kind of phrase it, um, to controller and vice president at SoCal Gas. Um, some of you may ask the question, you know, what would you change? And I will tell you that I will change anything. I wouldn't be here without, you know, the things I got right and the things I probably could have done a little bit better. But my intent with this evening is really to share with you what I've learned so that you can implement it in whatever way you like, maybe get there a little bit faster and ideally get there with a little bit less scar tissue along the process. So where am I from? I got some pictures here, but I'll walk you through this. So my name is Sara Piedad Zapata Mijares, and I come from a long line of hustling, hardworking Mexicanos. And my dad's crying, so I'm probably gonna cry, right? So, um, you know, my grandfather, his father, Alito Raul, came here as a baggage handler for American Airlines. Dad, you're supposed to wait and crying like 25 minutes. I'm just getting started. Um, and they put water, but no tissue, but we'll figure that out. Um, everyone's got tissue these days, right? Um, my Lito Enrique, who was my mother's father, came here as a bracero, which means he came here as part of the program where they shipped in people from Mexico to do the farming, the irrigation, whatever it might be, um, to just get those things done. Um, my father was, uh, came here at, I think, two years old, and by the age of three was the only English-speaking person in his family and the interpreter for everybody there. Mailita Juanita, his mother, came here at 16 with a child, left everything she ever knew, following her husband in a bigger dream. You're gonna have to stop crying at some point. <laughs> my mother's mom, my mamita, um, raised four kids pretty much by herself in Mexico on a teacher's salary, while her husband was here working as a bracero. Um, my mother came here at age 15, 16, didn't speak the language, got on a plane so she could pursue higher education, and by the grace of God and the kindness of a stranger who gave her a ride from the border to Los Angeles, met back up with her father. So I share these stories with you about amazing men and amazing women, but really want to highlight the women because they were my first memories and my first modeling of dedication and grit and taking risks. And those things are incredibly important as we continue to embark on the lives that we lead. As you can see from the stats, there's a lot of progress that's been made, but we have to remember where we come from. So I highlight this to you for two reasons. Um, I wanna make two points and I'll pop them up here, is it's gonna take a village for you to get to where you're trying to go. And sometimes you just have to put yourself out there and take that risk. So don't go it alone, right? Look around, see who can help you get there. Um, they have lessons that you can learn from. You don't, you know, a lot of times you're not the first person to go through it, and sometimes you are, right? Um, but, you know, reach out to individuals and put yourself out there. Um, you might put yourself out there and people are gonna say no. It took me a really long time to realize this, but that doesn't mean you're not somebody and that what you're doing is not relevant. So make the ask, and if they say no, do your best to not take it personal. Learn from it, but keep plowing forward and keep moving ahead. One of the things that I've done in those moments where I lose myself a little bit or I've heard a no and I thought it was really going to be a yes, right, is if you don't know what to do, you feel a little bit lost, help somebody else. I have found at times that by helping someone, I can say the words that I need to hear. Right? or by helping someone, I gain the perspective that I really needed. Um, so go out there and help somebody. And that's a lesson that I learned from my family. Right? It didn't matter that we didn't have a lot. We always had our door open. We always shared what we did have. Um, my parents inculcated in us in a very early age the importance of giving back, 
Um, I can remember being like five or six years old standing outside of a Montgomery Ward, which I think for most of you might be like a, like a Target or like a Kohl's um, in Bakersfield trying to register Spanish speaking voters. You know, we would walk precinct for local campaigns. Uh, we'd raise money for not for profits. Um, we were lucky enough to have a Lakota sweat lodge in our backyard for, for 20 years and, and have ceremony and break bread with people when they needed it and when we needed it the most. So I say that to you because I come from a long line of helping one another and the concept of paying it forward and being men and women for others is just getting started. So if you ever find yourself not sure what to do, help somebody out and you'll find the answers and you'll find that grit and you'll find that need to move forward that you're looking for. So that's a little bit of where I'm from. And in case anyone's wondering, that's my grandmother, my mom's mom. Um, this is when my grandma and my mother left, probably for the first time. My mom needed a break. And so my grandfather and dad decided to give me a bath. Needless to say, they were in very big trouble when they got back. <laughs> and then the picture at the end is myself and my mom um, at uh, Teotihuacan in Mexico. I was able to take her there um, when I was a professional at PwC, and she came and stayed for the week while I was working, and we got to go check it out, which was pretty cool. Um, so now that I've talked a little bit about where I'm from, I want to talk about where I've been. So I grew up in Whittier, which isn't too far from here, right? It's about 30 miles. Ever since they put that 105 in, it takes a lot less time to get here. It wasn't here back in the day. Um, and I went to Bishop Alma, which is a very small private school um, in La Puente. And um, I met two really important people while I was there. So the first person I met, getting my clicker figured out, um, was Victoria Ross. So she was my English and yearbook teacher. And what was so impressive about her is that she saw who I was and really encouraged it. Um, I spent a lot of my life trying to be quiet, like trying not to be bossy, trying to not swerve out of my lane. And she really embraced it and gave me these opportunities and these avenues to like give it a try and keep going and to lead. Um, she was also an amazing model of just being really confident in who she was and who her values were and just putting it out there. And it taught me to have the same confidence. Um, the second person that I met, Lisa Piametti Farland, who uh, runs our alumni relations. So I met Lisa not to date either one of us, 1997-ish, and it was at a college fair. She used to run or she used to work in admissions and she would go out to all the local high schools and look for candidates to come to LMU. And so I got to meet her and I was sitting there chatting her up, as you can imagine myself chatting somebody up at the age of 15. And she gave me a fee waiver application. And I tucked it in my bag, right? And I took it home and I started filling it out. And I didn't realize at the time, but it, like you had to pay like 40, $50 to apply to college, which was like ridiculous, right? And as I filled it out, I was so grateful that she saw that I was worth the investment. <laughs> because it was a big obstacle. Like you sit there and you're looking at it and you work really hard and then you realize something like 50 bucks could be the difference. And so I tell you these stories about these two amazing women because they literally, as the tear hits my hand, um, encouraged me like a way, in a way that no one outside my family had really previously encouraged me. And I tell you this because I found somebody that really inspired me to be me. Like they empowered me to be me. And when you find those people, hang on to them. It's really important. Um, I came here and I didn't lose my relationship with Ms. Ross. I didn't lose my relationship with Lisa. Um, frankly, I borderline stalked them. Right? Um, I found any opportunity I could to spend time with them, right? For Ms. Ross, um, she had two kids once um, I left the school and when she went out on business trips, she needed someone to watch her kids. So I would go with her, like gladly. I got to go check out Stanford. I stayed with her for a week. I watched her babies. Um, she did a Seinfeld yearbook and she called me because she needed help. So I got my name in like a Seinfeld yearbook and I also got to see her operate. Um, Lisa, I just literally stalked her from department to department to department to department. 
So I ran um, tours while she worked at admissions. I was an orientation leader for two summers. I helped set up the student worker program when you ended up moving over to alumni relations. I helped watch her kids while she was doing presentations like this, like I was in the back hanging out with her kids. And, and I share this with you because it was amazing to see someone lead like that with their authentic self. I had like this inside view of how you could navigate these things. And she was a woman and she had kids just like Vicky did, right? Like these amazing opportunities. And so I share these with you because it's really important if you come across someone, oh, that's my next one. But if you come across someone that really inspires you, hang on to them, follow them around in a completely not creepy way, right? <laughs> but it's special and it's really important to do that. I spent four years here at LMU and I was involved in, I don't know, just about everything you could think of. Lisa's nodding, Nicole's nodding, right? You'll learn about Nicole in a couple minutes, right? Um, I was in Mecha. I was a tour leader. I worked at like four different facilities on campus here. I, what did else I do? I was an accounting major. That's kind of a big deal, right? I worked at Sodexo Marriott. At some point, if anyone does have a tissue, that would be amazing. But um, I say this all to you because I was juggling this accounting degree. I was juggling all these amazing extracurricular activities. And I was also juggling about three to four jobs, depending on the time of year in the summer. And college was wonderful, but it kind of turned into this job, like this thing that I was doing to get to the next stage. And so I bring it up because what I've learned now as an adult is you've got to ruthlessly prioritize, like ruthlessly prioritize. That doesn't mean say no to everything. Anytime you start off on something new, thank you, husband, right? Oh, that one's a little wet, but we'll make it work. <laughs> but anytime you get started and, but it was awesome. Much love. Um, but anytime you get started on something new, you gotta hustle. Like you gotta work really hard. But what that means is you might have to put like the partying to the side or that thing that's nice to have to the side. Um, but at some point you find yourself realizing like your time and your resources are finite. So how do you ruthlessly prioritize to ensure that you're gonna get to where you wanna go? I share this with you because for me, as a child of an immigrant, as a first generation individual, as a female, and as a Latina, I really believed I could not say no. I could say a whole bunch of things that might be okay, but I couldn't say no. It wasn't an option. And that belief took about 15 years to kind of shake. That belief followed me into my personal life, into my professional life, and into my education life. And so I just kept piling it on. I just kept saying, sure, that sounds great. Sure, I'll take care of that. Sure, bring it on. And at some point, it's just too much to bear. And at the end of the day, it's not fun, right? And so I say that with you because I want to empower you to, when the time is right, say no. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Um, I'm in a really good place right now with my boss where I can just walk in and explain the situation and talk to her about what's on my plate, what I'd have to reprioritize, and what requires me to say no, right? And it's really great, but I say that because depending on where you're coming from and what you're bringing with you, you may have been trained to be a yes person. Yay, thank you, Patricia. Muchas gracias. Yay. And we're back in business. Perfect. So just ruthlessly prioritize. Like the concept of self-care, like I didn't know what that was until like a year ago. Right? A lot of you may be in a much better sphere and I see some heads nodding, right? But that's part of it. Like ruthlessly prioritize your health, who you are, and how you're going about things. But remember, anytime you get started, you gotta hustle. You gotta work hard, right? And so I told you a little bit about Bishop Amon. I told you a little bit about my time here. And what I wanted to do was talk to you about some key people or key moments from when I was at LMU. So I started off as a communications television production major. I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. 
that's what I wanted to do. And um, I took my first communications class, and no offense by any mean, but I realized that I really wanted a job, like right when I got out of here. Like I really, 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 did this, is this still working? Yes, I really wanted a job. And so um, I shared this story with a couple students earlier. I walked back to my dorm in Reigns, and I picked up this thing called the telephone that was attached to the wall. And I dialed a number, because you had like a book with codes, and I picked up an econ class, and I dropped the communications class, and I officially became a business major. And they make you take an accounting class. And I took the first class, and there was this wonderful professor who was a part-time professor, um, which at the time was a big, like, there was full-time professors, and there was like the part-time people. And Professor Knight pulled me aside and was like, you are really good at this. Just keep doing it. I'm like, hey, yeah, whatever, whatever. He's like, keep doing it. I'm like, fine, because I'm a yes girl. I'll sign up for the next accounting class, right? So I signed up for the class, and I kept being really good at it. And I met these phenomenal professors. I met Dr. DeSaro and Dr. Cherry and uh, Professor Falcon and Dr. Bangle, and they really created an environment to help me succeed while challenging me like I'd never been challenged before. But what those men helped to create along with the men and women before them was a phenomenal accounting program that got people here hiring us. So we had the big four recruiting, we had mid-tier recruiting, we had scholarship money because they'd all come in and put money in. And that was a big deal for me to have like paid internship opportunities and scholarship money. And I won't forget the day when I walked off stage and they were all there, just happy and giving me hugs. And they all knew that I was going to PricewaterhouseCoopers and were so incredibly proud because uh, they saw the investment and they took the time uh, and they knew important, how important that was to me. Um, I'm going to take this time to just make a small story, a small aside that I hadn't planned on sharing, but it's a funny story. So I met um, with my father's accountant when I was 14 years old. And I spent two hours as he reconciled the bank statement. And many of you may not know what that is, but back in the day, you got these bank statements and you cut checks. And there was copies to the checks. And so he sat there and he went, 101, check. 102, check. 103, check. And I was like, I'm never doing this. And I walked out and I told my father, over my dead body, will I be an accountant? Rosemary's laughing because she hasn't heard that one. <laughs> and I just walked back to my desk because I used to work for my father like 40 hours a week every summer. And I just got back to what I was doing. Needless to say, the last face I saw when I walked off stage was my father, smiling, going, really? And I'm like, yeah, 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 you were right. What do you want me to tell you, right? But it's a little different from that, but, but not really. But the next person that I met here that made a really big impact is my homegirl, Nicole, as I knew her, DeVoe, now Rodriguez. She was my sophomore suite mate in Reigns, and we were different majors, didn't hang out all the time, but really hit it off. Like when we really hung out, we really had a good time. Um, and what I find fascinating is that creator will put people in your lives, and if you take the time to notice, and you take the time to invest in it, it'll give you something down the road that you never foresaw coming. And um, Nicole and I didn't see each other for quite some time after we graduated. And because of her role as a career professional um, and my role as a always recruiting um, individual, we kept bumping into each other. And I'll talk a little bit about it later. Um, but it's been really important professionally to have her in my life and personally to have her in my life. I went through a couple things and I didn't know who to call and then I remembered Nicole had some insight into it. And even though I hadn't talked to her in years, I picked up the phone and called her. And it was really impactful. So thank you now and I'll thank you a little bit later. Um, Colin Hines, I already put the picture up here, um, couldn't make it tonight because he's hanging out with his boys, which is exactly where he's supposed to be. Um, he worked at Alumni Relations my senior year, so I met him in 2002, I believe, Lisa, and it was fascinating, right? Like as a young person who's getting ready to like embark on the real, real world, 
right? I got to sit down and talk with him. He came to LMU. He was a professional baseball player, was back at LMU in alumni relations. Um, and he was so um, wonderful with his time. Like I'd sit down and have like these really long conversations with him. And what I found fascinating was the values that he had. He's very grounded in his faith. And there have come times in my life where I needed that. I was having a moment, either because of the political climate or the professional climate or a terrible boyfriend or whatever it might be, right? I really needed to talk to someone. And he never judged me, but he always held me accountable. He always told me, it's your decision to be engaged. It's your decision to be part of this. And what are you gonna do about it in a way that I really needed? And it's been really great because now what I like to call him in my adult phase of my life, I've been working with him in various capacities. And they're really aimed at creating access to healthcare and access to education to whoever needs it. So he introduced me to Verbum Day. I'm on the board there. It's a Jesuit all boys institution in high school. Um, and he also introduced me to Heart of Los Angeles, which coincidentally, the director there is also an LMU alum. Um, and they do after school programming um, for underserved communities, largely Latino communities close to the MacArthur Park area. And, you know, him and I work together and we put on, you know, COVID vaccination clinics when, you know, a lot of, you know, my people couldn't get access to it. And so I'm just really proud to, you know, 20 years later, because that's where it's going, um, to call him my brother. And I share these with you because I want to give you my next takeaway, which is, build your circle, build your circle, like build your board of directors, whatever you want to call it, identify individuals in your life that are going to challenge you and lift you up at the same time. They don't, they shouldn't be the yes people. They shouldn't be the people that are like, you're great. You're awesome. You did nothing wrong. You don't need to change at all. You know, it's going to be people that make you cry. Sometimes it's going to be people that make you laugh. It's gonna be people that might review your resume when you're ready to like take the next leap or introduce you to somebody from a career perspective, but build that circulo. Have those people around you. It may ebb and flow over time, but going back to my first point on it, taking a village, really do that for yourself because it's important to have that sounding board, to have somebody to bounce things off of. And if it, you know, have shared values, but the different perspectives are important because when we walk out, we're not talking to people just like us necessarily. And sometimes you need to understand you know, how to decode that. So I'll transition a little bit to my time at PwC or my time in Big Four now and um, kind of how I got there. So much like you or some of you, I joined the Accounting Society. They had pizza at lunch and I'd pop in here and they started talking about paid internships. And now I was really listening. Right? I'm like, what? They're going to pay you to go to work? This is awesome. Where do I sign up? Where do I interview? And the big four firms, you know, would come out and they'd recruit, right? They'd come out and they'd have panels and they'd talk to you about their opportunities. And I met this amazing, energetic, very pregnant at the time, partner from PwC named Jill Tregillis Bacon. And I remember just sitting out there like you were. And I looked at her and was like, I want to work in public accounting. Like, I actually believe it. Like, I want to do this. And I'm going to be a partner one day. Like, this is awesome. She is awesome. She's going to have a baby. She loves her job. I'm in. Like, where do I sign up? Who do I interview with? Right? And so I got an internship that summer in the audit practice in Los Angeles. I started full time in 2003. Um, I was there for 17 and a half years, which I'll talk about in a couple minutes. Um, and the first three and a half were great. I didn't work with her, but they were awesome. Um, and then I did get to a point in my career where I'm like, I don't know, this doesn't feel like it's like, like I'm making the traction I used to those first couple years. I felt like I wasn't quite getting the best opportunities. And so I gave her a call and I said, hey, I feel like I hit like a bit of a like roadblock here. So she called a couple people and called me back and said, you've hit a bit of a roadblock. And I said, cool. So what does that mean? And she's like, come work for me. And I'm like, really? She's like, yeah, just work hard. Keep doing what you're doing. Put yourself out there. 
and I'll make sure that you have the opportunities to get you to the next spot. And she sure did. I mean, it was night and day. That first day I walked into her practice or into her group, she took me from partner's office to partner's office to partner's office and said, this is Sarah and she is the future of this place. And I was like, shoot, that's a lot of pressure and that is awesome, all at the same time. And then we'd go to the next one and the next one and the next one. And she'd take me to the clients and say, if you need anything, you talk to her first and then you call me. And I was so overwhelmed and going back to my definition of belonging, like I felt like I belonged. She credentialed me, she gave me opportunities and it was a really great introduction as to how you can do that job and do it well and do it right. So I spent 17 years at the firm, so that could take a whole two hour session. So I'll spare you all of the details, but what I did wanna highlight, um, Dr. Kim talked a little bit about this on the front end, but I worked in Los Angeles for most of my career. I spent six months in New York. I spent two years living in London. I spent five years on and off working with our Mexico office in a variety of capacities. I've audited every type of company besides banking that you could think of. Public, private, not-for-profit, for-profit, SpaceX, Disney, um, USC. I mean, it was dependent on the day. I'd start off one day auditing UC Santa Barbara and then find myself in a completely different place at the end. It was a really fabulous introduction into the business world for somebody that had very limited experience in it. Um, I had great opportunities. I met great people. Um, it was really wonderful. Uh, I got to participate in Alpha, which at the time was called the Association of Latinos in Professional Finance and Accounting. And I got to do some board work with them locally. I got to go to their annual conferences and meet a ton of people that looked like me or had similar stories that were successful in their profession, which was so empowering and just awesome, you know, to be able to see. And I have some of those relationships to this day. Um, I recruited like it was nobody's business. I mean, I was out there all the time recruiting because I really felt like I got handpicked by somebody that saw something in me and opened those doors. And I really had to pay it forward, right? I really had to go out there and take care of that. Um, and I really enjoyed myself there. Um, I spent 11 of those years single. I spent six of them married and I spent four of them as a working mom. And I say that because they each presented different transitions and they each presented different opportunities and different challenges and obstacles that I had to overcome. And then I got to a point in my career around 2020 where it just kind of felt like it stalled out. I was working on all like the big projects. I got called in to do a lot of like, oh crap, emergency remediation, you know, type of stuff. I had really great client relationships. I had teams that really liked to work for me, but it just didn't seem to be moving the needle and kind of getting me to that next stage. Um, and candidly, I had no coach. I had no mentor and I had no sponsor. And each one of those does something different for you. And you need one of each of those to really continue to propel. Um, and I had to make some decisions about what my next steps were. Um, going back to the Circulo and going back to the village, uh, I met with other working moms that were accounting professionals um, that had left public accounting and just said, how did you know? Like, how did you know it was time? Uh, I met with a couple that were in the firm doing well and said, how did you know to stay? Um, and I just decided it was time to do the unthinkable and not stay in public accounting. And in this particular case, just take a break, like not work. Like I hadn't not worked since I, I don't know when. And it was really scary. Like, I mean, this is the longest relationship I've ever had. I entered in 2002, it's 2020, it's 18 years of my life, right? Um, and going back to, um, Dean, uh, Dean Dale's story, I was so committed to it that I bought these shoes, <laughs> these sparkly, wonderful, magical shoes about 12 years ago, and I was gonna wear them the day I made partner. And they've been sitting in my closet for a very long time. That's how committed I was to this. So the decision to move wasn't easy. 
The decision to move was hard. We go back to, I'm a yes girl, and let's make everybody happy. Um, but I did it for a variety of reasons, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But I really decided like it was time to bet on me. And it was time to get to a place where if I was going to spend the energy, it was because I was going in the next direction. So let me see if I got this right. Be you, ruthlessly prioritize, build your seed glow. That's a little bit about where I've been. That was a little rundown of my time in high school, my time here at LMU, my time at PWC. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about where I'm at, which leads a little bit to why I am now wearing the partner shoes. So before I talk about my amazing experience at SoCal Gas, I want to walk you through how I got from the break at PwC to here. It wasn't without its challenges and tears. Um, it wasn't an easy decision, but I figured, hey, I've never not worked. This is actually kind of a good thing. My husband was at a company that was scheduled to sell relatively soon. We had two kids and I was like, hey, finish this transaction and like we'll move to a country that speaks Spanish. We're trying to raise the kids bilingual. So I was like, we'll just pack up our stuff and like go somewhere for a month or two. We'll find some inner peace. We'll have piña coladas or whatever they serve locally, right? The kids will learn Spanish. It's going to be like a win, 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 win. And like we'll recharge and we'll regroup. That was January of 2020. Yep, know where I'm going with this. Yep. Um, yeah, and then COVID hit in March of 2022, 2020. And um, I went for, from looking for inner peace to toilet paper and baby wipes. I was raising my own children full time, right? And my husband's transaction like completely stalled because the place he was at really required face-to-face -face interaction. And they went from taking offers to rethinking the whole thing. So now he's working twice as hard. Um, and so it was an interesting transition. It was an interesting pivot. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. But you know what they say about best laid plans, right? And so I started to think about, OK, what am I going to do now? Because I'm not finding inner peace anytime soon. So what am I going to do? And I said, OK. The other thing I realized from raising my own children full time is I really like having a job. They are wonderful. I hear lots of laughters from the moms up here. They are wonderful, amazing, beautiful people, but a little distance makes the heart grow fonder, right? And so I really considered what am I going to do? Do I go back to work? I clearly told you staying at home was not an option. Um, do I get a PhD? Uh, do I do something different from accounting? For like a hot second, I was like, I'll be an entrepreneur. And I was like, oh, geez, I got these two kids. I can't figure that out right now. Um, and then I did what I talked to you about earlier. I leaned very heavily on my seed glue. And I started making phone calls. One of them, again, to my homegirl, Nicole. And I said, hey, Nicole, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my life. And she threw something back at me that I always ask. She said, Sarah? well, what's your definition of success? And I said, it sounds way better when I ask other people, <laughs> right? And I said, I really want to be in a position where I can positively impact others. I really want to be able to promote access to education, healthcare, job opportunities for, you know, underrepresented individuals. And it sounds rehearsed, but that's really what I told her. Um, and she said, cool, get a job. Keep recruiting diverse talent, retain them, credential them, and then donate money. And I was like, well, damn, OK, guess I'm getting a job. Right? This goes back to have your seed go lined up with the right people, right? So I started my job hunt during COVID. Very interesting experience. And I went 0 and 2 out the gate. Got in there, super excited. Nope. Next one, nope. And I called them back and said, I'd love you to tell me why I wasn't fit for this job. And they both said, you don't have enough hands-on experience. And I was like, geez, I just spent 17 years being an international businesswoman, and I don't have hands-on experience. Um, contrary to my previous advice, I took it very personally, <laughs> very very personally. My husband laughs because he got to witness the roller coaster ride, 
that was me getting two rejections during COVID, trying to contemplate the next step of my life. And I point out that all of this is happening during COVID. I'm exhausted from raising my two beautiful children. Um, and I really, I, I, I was not in a good place. I really wasn't. Um, and then my wonderful husband stepped in and told me that I was awesome and good at my job and that I had to trust the process because there was a place out there for me. And these two places were clearly not it. And so I'm not gonna lie, I didn't believe him for like a little while. And then I really got to thinking about it and he said the right things. He looked at me and told me, it doesn't matter how long it takes, you pick the right spot. And that's really important when you think about it. First of all, I'm really glad that he's who he said he was when I married him, right? As evidenced by that comment, but he reminded me that I am credentialed. I am an expert in my arena, that I work very, very hard, that I'm a badass international businesswoman. And I picked myself off off the floor, depending on the day, maybe literally, dusted myself off and just decided that I was gonna get a job. I didn't know how long it was gonna take, but I wasn't gonna take those two rejections personally and I was gonna find the right spot. And my husband who sits here quietly or not quietly, depending on what's going on, um, is a really awesome accountant by his own, you know, he's got a phenomenal uh, path that he's taken. He spent a little less time in public accounting, but he's got 20 years of hands-on experience. And I don't say that jokingly. And it was really important. I really appreciated when we met that I was gonna be able to bounce these types of things off of him. Some people don't like talking about what they do at work at home and that's totally fine, but that's just not me. I really appreciated having him in my seat Google and being able to bounce this stuff off of. Sometimes he tells me, babe, that's not the right way to approach it. Sometimes he's like, that could work. You know, just kind of depends. Um, but it's really important to have that in your corner. And the minute that I believed what he was saying, it all changed. Like it just started happening. I decided that I was just gonna go with it, regardless of what happened. And I got a really cool, awesome offer um, to apply for this thing controller position at SoCal Gas. So short story, I'm at SoCal Gas. It's awesome, it's amazing. Um, I got the opportunity to talk to my now boss before the interview and um, she asked me what I wanted. And for the first time, I was able to very clearly articulate it. And I told her I wanted to work at a good company. Good company, good track record, happy employees. I wanted to work at a place that the leadership understood that like we were human beings, not robots. And that means we come with really awesome stuff and then, you know, a little bit extra that we gotta, you know, navigate. And I wanted to work in an environment of advocacy and sponsorship where people open doors for each other uh, and we're really focused on collaborating, uh, you know, people just helping each other. Um, and the more I got to know about the company, the more excited I was about it. So I came into the company during COVID, didn't meet a single person in person for a year um, at the assistant controller level. Um, and some of the things I did to get there um, really were focused on meeting as many people as I could, right? But once I got there, she credentialed the tar out of me, right? She told people I was there for a reason um, and they gave me a lot of opportunities to shine. There were extra opportunities that I took upon myself to lead and learn more about the company. And a year after my start date, I was promoted to uh, vice president of accounting and finance and assistant controller. And a year after that, I was promoted to controller. And um, at the time, I knew it was a big deal, but as I've spent more time thinking about the size of the company and the impact that one can have and those stats we talked about earlier where representation matters, it was a big deal, right? But she saw something in me. She saw the same thing my husband did. She saw the same thing this place did. She saw the same thing Nicole and Lisa did. She saw the same thing Miss Ross did. And they're investing in me and putting me out there and giving me these opportunities. And I'm just really proud, you know, to be part of that team. So I'll challenge you, wherever you are, be exceptional. And regardless of your title, lead. 
It doesn't matter what your title is or where you're at, with it, whether it's with a colleague, a peer, a boss, like lead, lean in there, lead, like be the change that you want to see. And, you know, don't wait for any permission. I think technically is just, we live in a time of great uncertainty and it can be scary, but it shouldn't stop you from going forward and doing what you want to do. Uh, the organizational effectiveness team at SoCal Gas presented recently on leading through times of uncertainty. And for me, it was juggling my kids' needs, especially in light of some unexpected developments that have come up. And the reason that causes me a lot of anxiety or fear is because it conflicts with my values of being reliable and being supportable, and frankly, being responsible for my children. But when you think about the uncertainty and you name it, and you think about the values and conflict, you can easily ask yourself what your actions are gonna be. And so I'm gonna build up my village and I'm gonna lean on them. I'm gonna set up play dates for the kids, right? I'm gonna consult my circle. Some of them have gone through some of the things I'm going through with my kids and they can help me kind of cut to the chase and figure out like, what do I do about this? And lastly, to my earlier point, I'm gonna ruthlessly prioritize where I spend my time. So there might be like a fun happy hour or a fun event at work, like it's just not gonna happen for a little while, right? I gotta go back to being comfortable saying no here and there. And what I will tell you is that as far as where I'm going, I'm gonna to continue to take the credentials I have as a professional. I'm gonna to continue to take what I've learned and I'm gonna to continue to give back. I'm gonna to continue to be involved in my community. I'm gonna to continue to come back here as long as you all are willing to listen. And I challenge you as well to remember that whatever you do today is gonna to impact seven generations forward. So lead. Be you, go in unapologetically and authentically yourselves into whatever you do because you are your superpower. And I will leave it at that.